It's the My Michelle Live podcast. Looking for the God story and news of the day. My Michelle Live news and views. Here's Michelle. Hey, thank you for making My Michelle Live part of your day. I promise it's going to pay off today. Although you got to ask yourself, what in the world is going on? A pandemic. And now really monkeypox? Could it get any weirder? Civil unrest, riots, threats of World War III. Thank you, Putin. And senseless mass shootings. My friends, the world has gone absolutely nuts. And if you're not terrified, then you are either not paying attention or something that the rest of the world doesn't. And that's precisely what we're going to share with you today. Something that the rest of the world doesn't know. Something that should in the end give you peace and give you hope if the headlines seem horrifying my friend then hold on we're going to turn those headlines to hope joining me in the mission today is george mains now he has had an interest in biblical prophecy for the last three decades He's the author of a couple of books like the assurance of heaven and most recently vanished when millions go missing, George claims that there are at least 15 truths that are happening or have happened that are straight out of current events that align with ancient biblical prophecies. And these things might actually show that there's something else afoot. It may be so crazily uncanny that you sit back and go, whoa. God's doing something. George, thanks for hanging out with us today. Thank you for making time. Thank you, Michelle. It's my pleasure. Oh, so you have been delving in for the last 30 years. In the last 30 years, has anything like the last maybe three years <laughs> been as crazy? No, not in my lifetime. There are so many things happening now, and it's just uncanny in a way when you start comparing what the biblical prophecies of the future are in the scriptures and about what we see going on in the world today. You could say unprecedented times. I've noted that we have also been in an unprecedented time of peace. War, famine, upheaval has been the norm in human history since mm. the beginning. We have had this relative time of peace and prosperity and everything's just going well. So when things get turned a little bit upside down, people really have really are freaking because this isn't our norm in our lifetime. But beyond that, as you mentioned, it's not just the war and the upheavals and the plagues. It's all of those things happening together, it seems now. I, and, you know, that I think I summed up at the end or toward the end of my book about convergence. And I've heard others speak about <laughs> that, too, how prophecies seem to be converging. It's not just one or two or here or there. It's And I do agree with you. We've always had upheaval in the world from time to time. And I think times people have looked, oh, this has got to be the time Jesus is coming back. If and, not, and I please, understand please. But today, I think there's just so many more things that are coming together from different areas of and events in, in the world. It's just me and, and I think others that studied Bible prophecy said, this, there's something going on here. If you're of the biblical worldview, there are days where I've just said that whole Jesus returning thing, now would be a good time. Just, right. just go ahead. Now's a good time. <clears throat> I want to uh, show on screen for those who are watching. This is the book, Vanished When Millions Go Missing. We'll talk about what that means for the average listener who's going missing. What are you talking about? But I want to take us back to one of the first chapters in your book, The Significance mm -hmm. of 1948. Mm -hmm. What's that about? That was by, I think, May 14th, <clears throat> 1948 is when Israel became a nation again. And if you follow their history a little bit, I'm certainly not an expert on it, but you can go and find out pretty easily details about the number of people, the Jew, Jewish people that went in that land back in the 1800s weren't very many in the thousands. And gradually they began to migrate back 
to Israel and, and through, I think, the culmination of a couple war, world wars, Israel out of, came out of that kind of when they started dividing the land up for people and they were restored back as a sovereign nation in 1948 which I believe fulfills biblical prophecy when God says that he's going to, he would bring them back into the land. And how many people groups after 2000 years are restored back to their homeland? I think they're probably the only ones. They're the only ones that have mm -hmm. returned, been recognized as their own sovereign state. It is mm -hmm. nothing more than miraculous. We have a lot of things that surround Israel that are quite miraculous. In the 1960s, we saw a war that right. lasted mere days against mm. a bigger, stronger power. How is that possible? Mm. These things, a one-off is like, what? But when you see these things take place and you put them together in a bunch, you see something much bigger and it's hard to... I Yes, I agree with you. There's a number of things. And I think the other, one of the other things is the desire for the Jewish people to have a temple on it again and, and for that. And I think there's, from what I understand, there's, they're really pushing for that to, to occur, which is really a fulfillment of what in the scripture is there will be a temple existing in Israel again. And so that, that to me is another interesting thing that you see along with all the other kind of supernatural things of how Israel has grown in their, uh, the abundance that they've, and the wealth that they've grown into over there, I think again is fulfilling biblical prophecy. One article from the Jewish press that I have on screen, mm. there is a lot of talk about the rebuild of the temple. Now, how does that fit in with biblical prophecy? What does the Bible say? In Revelation chapter 11, you will see that there's a temple existing in the last seven years. And you also see in Second Thessalonians chapter 2 about the abomination of desolation when the person we refer to as the Antichrist goes into the temple of God and declares himself to be worshiped as God. So there must be a temple in order for him to enter into in the last days for that day. Again, lining up and clustering together, forming a much bigger picture. There are right. some things that are happening today, dealing with technology, transhumanism, and uh, many other current events that are part of that cluster. George, these cluster of events that have been biblically prophesied are mm -hmm. uncanny and worth attention. But something that I think is equally important is the history and reliability of biblical prophecy, which mm -hmm. is in itself um, uncanny, outstanding, and without flaw. And that it is so important to look at that because in the greater scheme of looking at a biblical worldview or deciding if this whole God thing is real, the Bible, where science is concerned, it's weird how the Bible talks well beyond the science of its day, mm -hmm. describing things that we're only discovering in the last decade right. you're going whoa you look at the history of this person jesus and that he is the most confirmed and his story is the most confirmed in all of human history that in itself is uncanny another right. piece of that cluster of the accuracy of a biblical worldview is biblical prophecy can you address mm -hmm. that <clears throat> yeah i think you when you look at the Bible, there's four things I look at it for the authority that it's a divine book. Okay. And it's manuscript evidence, it's archaeological evidence, it's biblical prophecy, and it's science. And all four of those things, and particularly prophecy, has been so accurate. Critics of the book of Daniel tried to say that Daniel had to be written after the fact because there's so much detail that Daniel foretold about the future that can only come from someone that was giving him information that knew what the future would bring. And that's obviously would have been the Lord. Okay. And so you would see critics of Daniel saying that, well, but it, it's been proven that Daniel wasn't written early. It was written later or earlier, not later. 
And those events were all prophetic, including the, the 70 week prophecy of Daniel, the 490 years. And when, and actually the, after the 69th year that the Messiah would be cut off, I want to get it. It's a little bit complex, but if you look at that and you study that, that, that brought that, that prophesied the Messiah right down to the, almost to the day that he rode into Jerusalem, which the Old Testament predict, uh, prophesied that he would ride in on a foal of a donkey, that he would be born in Bethlehem. And there's 300 prophecies about the Messiah. Most of those are out of the control of Jesus. It's not, he could choose, okay, I'm going to ride in on a donkey. That's something he could right. choose, to be honest. But there are hundreds of others. He had no control over the place of his birth. He had no control over the timing of his birth. So many of these, it's uncanny. And kids, we're not talking Nostradamus here, which are, right. which are some weird right. coincidences, but it's a lot of hits and all, even more his, misses, we'll say. We're not talking about that. We're talking about extraordinary accuracy without flaw. Now, if, and I'm going to ask you to be, please be painfully honest. I don't want to mm. mess with people's heads here. I don't want to yeah. paint a picture of God if it's not right. Am I correct in saying that biblical prophecy has been without flaw? Has there been some, oh, this isn't exactly. Biblical moments. prophecy is 100% accurate. Now, some of it hasn't come to hasn't been fulfilled yet. So we're looking forward to those times, but any, okay. anything that you look back to that God said was going to happen, it happened. There isn't even critics out there that can say, no, uh, th there just really isn't. It's much like people who say the accuracy of the Bible. There, You have all these transcripts and there's discrepancies. You know what? They're actually right. And those discrep mm -hmm. you know what those discrepancies are? They are, oh, a the where it should have been an and or a slight right. misspelling. We have hundreds of years and hundreds of manuscripts to compare against each other. And yet somehow how the Bible has remained. So you can't look at these things and not go, wow, that's, dude, there's something to it. Jesus said that his words would never pass away. And so here we are 2000 years later, still reading his words. Who could say that? You're right. Without, and that without being, with it being fulfilled like that. I mm -hmm. hear these things. And once you actually turn over and you go, you know what? I have to believe and I surrender to you, God. You hear these things and it's like an explosion that goes on in your heart. Let's get into some of the things that are happening today. You mentioned in your book, things like technology, transhumanism, catchphrases of the day. How do these very modern things that weren't even imagined in biblical times tie into biblical prophecy? Yeah, you, I'm not a scientist. I can't speak with authority on all these things, but I do. I can read and see what's going on in the world. And you just see the robot, you see the robotics and the AI and all the things that they're coming up with today. I think I did watch one of your programs before with a fellow who was talking about AI with making music. And I thought that was interesting how <laughs> it was, it can make music and, and all those sort of things. And in, in the book of Revelation, you actually see where the uh, false prophet is going to cause people to make an image of the Antichrist and that it should speak and, and be worshiped. And those who fail to worship this image will be given a death penalty, so to speak. And so you actually have the capabilities of that being able to happen today with the amount of science, scientific technology that we have out there. If you look into any of the robotics and that, you can just watch them online. There's one came it's called Sophia and they can basically carry a conversation on with you. And then you have Elon Musk coming out with the neuro link chip that they want to put into your brain that, so you don't have to, you can pretty much just connect with your computers and your phones without having to even touch them. And who knows what else, they're going to try to do with. To me, we're getting to the point where people and some of these highly intelligent people, way more intelligent than I am, are being led to believe that somehow they're going to be able to <clears throat> download their information in their brain and put it into a ro robot or, or some sort of AI and be able to continue to live after their physical body dies. As Christians, we know that's impossible because they have a soul and that's what ultimately ends up 
either with the Lord or without or not in the lake of fire eventually. I think people are really being deceived by these things today, even though there are a lot of good things that can be done with these things. Yeah, they are both exciting Mm -hmm. and helpful. But they can Mm -hmm. also be terrifying, a lot of the technology that we have today. And we have seen the effects of both. While Mm -hmm. technology has connected us around the world and we can share a program like this with a message, a God story Mm -hmm. and a message of hope around the world. At the same time, the misuse of technology has caused kids to be disenfranchised, more disconnected in a connected world, suicide rates among youth especially mm. has gone up we we seem to be less happy than we ever have been before so there really is right. in all this advancement something mm. seriously missing where we're talking about technology or we're talking mm-hmm. about AI and the future. But there are some other things that I wanted to take on. I'm looking through some of the chapters of your book and they align with current events. Are the Russians real? Are the Russians coming? We see the headlines with the Ukraine. We hear the threats of a seemingly unbalanced leader saying, crying mm-hmm. out for World War III. And while we're living our lives relatively in peace and Mm. going about our daily lives, don't fool ourselves in the back of our heads. We see those headlines and we go, okay, what's next? It was interesting when I wrote that chapter and and all those chapters are short. I did it that way on a purpose. So people, I'm just trying to plant a seed. People think about things and research them yourselves. And I tried to write a shorter book so people would actually read it because I know people aren't real readers today for the most part. <laughs> but as far as the Russians go, when, I mean, you can look in Ezekiel 38, 39, and you see there, you know, in Magog and Gog, who is a leader, and <clears throat> who knows who that is. I'm not saying it's Putin. I don't know. No, but, but we do, we be... can know that we're talking about Russia or we can know. Russia, the... yeah. So you do see Russia and Turkey and Iran and you see there's even others and that there, God says that there's going to be an invasion against the mountain of Israel when Israel is dwelling safely. And obviously when they're being, when they're living prosperously because they're coming to plunder and to take booty, according to that, those <clears throat> couple chapters there. And the interesting thing about it, when I did write that chapter and I talked about nuclear weapons and shared the fact that that the nuclear weapons that was dropped in Japan, we have ones that are 3,000 times more powerful than those, never ever giving a thought that someone, you know, within a month after I wrote that chapter came out and actually threatened to, to use a nuclear weapon, which who was Putin. That was pretty unbelievable to me that after I had written that chapter and then he came out with that. And I thought, wow, I never thought anybody was that crazy even to to bring that issue up because in retaliation, that's, it it would just, it would annihilate pretty much the entire civilization. If it escalated, obviously. How crazy are we that we create such weapons of mass destruction? Even if you don't look at it through the lens of a biblical worldview, George, people look at this and say, is the human race Uh, doomed to destroy themselves. We certainly have the potential to be more deadly than any other time in world history just because of the type of weapons that we do have today. So when you add that to the depravity of man, when the Bible says the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked, Jeremiah 17, and you couple these things together, you can only imagine that the sooner or later something will happen. And I do think when you look into the book of Revelation, and I'm not going to say that's nuclear war, but you do see where there's a lot of destruction and death going on in that last seven year period of planet earth, so to speak, before Christ returns. So uh, anything else that we can look at in today's news that when you see the headlines, you, George, as student of biblical prophecy went, whoa. One of the things I did when I went, it, I didn't even plan on writing a book. I just was here. Actually, I was hearing a lot of this information off secular pe- news or podcasts or whatever. I'm thinking, wow, they're saying stuff that comes right out of the Bible, basically. <laughs> so that, that got me started stirred up to start just writing some thoughts down and one of the things i ran across was the euphrates river where it, and i checked it and double checked it the best as i could and it was incredible to me that 
even the tigers, from what I understand, are like drying up in Iraq. And it's because of three things, basically. One is the weather's hotter. There's Number two is there's less rainfall. Number three, there's the dams are being built in Turkey where the river, the source of the river comes from. And even in Syria, there's a few dams. And it's slowing the water and the amount of water that's flowing through what would be called ancient Babylon. And um, the interesting thing to me was in Revelation chapter 16, verse 12, it talks about God's going to dry up the Euphrates rivers to allow the kings of the east to cross. And I just, I thought that was an incredible thing. And I'm not going to imply that's being fulfilled right now because God could supernaturally do that at that point time whenever that but that it's comes. worth a little whoa that's a, well, that that's is a whoa what moment I thought. Yeah. yeah i thought wow this is interesting and it's the same thing with the nile river i ran across that and did not know the nile was actually experienced not that he have, not to the degree the euphrates is but there's still issues with the nile river and mm. and dams being built south of egypt and stopping some of the water flow there and of course there's 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 some prophecy about the nile river and how in the end that it'll be uh, won't be usable and things of that nature. So ran across an article about that. Then again, what we're looking at is a cluster. We're looking at not just wow, this is a crazy story, and look how it fits into biblical prophecy. But from 1948 to th- 2022, a host of differing news stories that you can put into a pile and go, wow, they paint a bigger picture. And that picture may be worth looking at. It sounds like a lot of doom and gloom. And the average person who may not be part of the God story, George, they right. may be going, oh, so you're talking about the Bible and all it is a bunch of doom and gloom. Nice God you've got there. But that's mm. not the that's not the real biblical narrative. And I thought it's important that we share that. Yeah, I, that's a very good point because I like to share the gospel with people because it's good news. And it's because God loved us, loves us. And he demonstrated his love toward us. And while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Jesus paid the penalty for our sin on the cross. We have no penalty to pay. But there's one thing we must do. We must believe on the Lord Jesus Christ to be saved. In other words, we must put our confidence in what God did for us. And not in our own goodness or our own works. But in Jesus' work on our behalf, through his death, burial, and resurrection, he made a way back to God. And so that we can have a relationship with God. We can have it right now. And we don't have to fear these times. And that's why I wrote the book, because I want to make, hopefully, to help people, drive people to the Lord to see that the Bible speaks to the end times and these things are going to end. I think you did a thing on Noah's Ark or something one of your programs, yeah. they didn't believe the flood was coming. The people in Noah's day, they just dismissed Noah. And it was a one-time event. Christ is coming back. And in a rapture, it's going to be a one-time event when the dead in Christ will rise first. And then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And that's what Always be with the Lord. the Lord. I love that. Yeah. <laughs> Therefore, comfort one another with these words. They're comforting words. And the words that God gave us to comfort us and to encourage us that his grace, our hope is in his grace that's going to be revealed at the revelation of Jesus Christ, 1 Peter 1.13. So there's great hope in Christ. Outside of Christ, there is no hope. That's because this is, history is his story. We have Uh, misery and sadness and division and all of the things that we mentioned at the beginning of this program as a result of sin. God Mm -hmm. gave us a free choice. We chose to have a knowledge, an intimate knowledge of good and evil, Mm -hmm. not just a let's look on it and oh, that's a bad thing. But uh, we have tasted of that apple of evil and we are living with the results. But God made a way that we can have forgiveness. We can Mm -hmm. have uh, a relief from the effects of sin and a relationship with the living God. It is loving and it is hopeful and it Mm -hmm. makes sense, as you mentioned. 
It makes sense. Biblically, it makes sense. Spiritually, scientifically, in, in prophecy, in every single way, a biblical worldview makes sense. But right. the most important thing is that it gives us a hope, not just mm -hmm. a hope like, oh, I hope, but an a assurance kind of a hope. It's like sitting in a chair. You don't just, I hope it holds my big fat hind. Right. You have an assurance <laughs> because it's made well that when you sit down on it, it's going to hold, it's going to hold you. That's the kind of hope we're talking about. Yeah. The biblical definition of the word hope in the New Testament typically is a confident expectation. It's confidence, it's assurance, like you said. We can have assurance, we can know that we're gonna to go to heaven either at the rapture or when we physically die because God told us in his word. The apostle John wrote to in First John, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God yeah. so that you may know you have eternal life. You can know it if you believed on the Lord Jesus Christ to save you from your sins, to, provide forgiveness for your sins and restore you to relationship with him and to give you the free gift of everlasting life. You can know that because God says you can know it. A couple other things in our final moments together, George, what do you think is going to be the way the church is going to react in these days leading up to the eventual rapture, the Armageddon, and all of the big news stories that we see looming in the future. What about the pe What about the everyday believer? Because we've been going along our lives and in relative complacency to a degree. Do you foresee some change in that? Do you see the spark lighting a fire? What's going to happen? Revival? What? Yeah, I honestly don't see a revival, but I do see distinctions being made in people serious about their faith or typically if you start studying you get into the word and you start seeing these things i think it it's going to make a difference in your relationship with god and the way you're living your life and how you're in, in, interacting with other people because you want other people to know these this truth you want other people to be saved before the end comes we have a hope how can you right. how can you hide that hope really when you see what's going on in the news and that's where i am hoping for a, a, a revival not a televangelism let's everybody tens of thousands of people coming and someone important person on stage asking people to come forward i am hoping and praying for just the everyday people like me like maybe Amen. you that change so, but... in our lives and we mm -hmm. right and that we're reaching out right. to the neighbor next to us i want right. to see that kind of real life revival in our lives because we have a Amen. hope george and i'm right. excited about i read your book and i'm talking yeah. to you and i am i'm jazzed the kind of jazzed i'm jazzed like when my seattle sounders just won Concacaf <laughs> champion league right i was jazzed right. that's that it's that level of jazz like on steroids God's right. got something going on here and it's exciting. The last thing I wanted to talk about is a lot of folks who are in the biblical know and talk about a Bible prophecy. Mm. We can get caught up on a lot of things. And I appreciate that in your book, you it's not about being dogmatic about, oh, I don't know, pre-trib, post-trib, no-trib, right. whatever. It's about what is the Bible saying? How does that line up with what's happening and what's the hope in Christ? And I appreciate that because tr you, you often, you've you often said in this interview, I don't know, but this is mm -hmm. what I think. And I love right. that because I don't care when Jesus is coming. I just know that he is. And that's where my hope needs to be. I want to give you the final word. Yeah, I would agree with that. I would definitely am a pre-trib person, but I would just say, rather than arguing with one another over these things necess unnecessarily, I think sometimes it's more important. I think we can all agree that the command is that we are to be looking for, or actually we could be waiting for the blessed hope and the glorious of appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. And even in Philippians chapter three, verse 20, it says we're to be eagerly waiting our citizenship is in heaven from whom we're, which we're eagerly waiting for our lord and savior jesus christ that should be our attitude and that that kind of attitude changes the way i view life okay if i know that jesus can come back at any moment yeah. <laughs> then that's going to change the way i live i used a 
little illustration in a book about my wife and I being in a restaurant and it wasn't very busy and the kids weren't doing a whole, whole lot of anything until the owner that came spinning into the parking lot and one of the kids yells, here comes the boss and they all got busy real fast. I want to be, if Jesus comes today for me, I want to be about his business. Here comes the boss. I don't want to be spinning my wheels doing my own thing. But here comes the boss. And this right. is a shout out to my friends way back in the day in youth group. Have you ever heard the phrase Klujix? The What was that again? Have you ever heard the phrase Klujix? It's an acronym. Keep looking no. up. Jesus is coming soon. Oh, keep looking up. Keep yeah. looking Amen. up. Jesus is yeah. coming soon. So George Klujix to you <laughs> and to you watching, listening, reading, viewing, whatever you're doing. Thank you for being part of the show. I want to give you some insight into what you could be looking at when you get vanished, when millions go missing, it's on screen. And if wherever you're listening or viewing, there, there should be a link. If not, go to mymichellelive.com and you can just link right up to both of these great books by my new friend, George Maines. Thank you, George, for being with us today. And as Thank you're you, here, Michelle. It's very, enjoyed it very much. Thank you very I'm much. I'm so glad you did. And I'm so glad you're listening. As you watch this or view it or read it, please comment and share mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. we share the God story and that God story needs to get out there. And the more that you are part of this by sharing it or even just putting a little comment, a smiley face, those add to the algorithm and this mm -hmm. message gets out even more. Social media puts it out even more. The places that you mm -hmm. listen to it will get it out even more. As we do that, the God story gets shared. And I thank you for being part of that. And thank you, George. Amen. Catch you next time. Okay. More news and views at mymichellelive.com.